Okay, well, um, good evening. Welcome to Trout, Drought, and Floods, How Trees Impact the Gallatin Watershed. This is the eighth event in our series, on the one hand, at least celebrating trees and forests, culminating in our annual Earth Day Festival on April 20th at the Gallatin County uh, Fairgrounds. Uh, if you'd like to watch a recording of a previous event, or would like to find out about some upcoming events, please um, visit our website at www.gallatinvalleyearthday.org. So I'm three, thrilled to see all of you here tonight, and I wanted to welcome you online also for, um, to be, um, welcome you. And uh, I just wanted to uh, quick ask our audience members here uh, a quick show of hands. I'm just curious how many of you in the audience um, fly fish. Okay, that's almost half. So um, I just was curious. And uh, I don't know how, maybe you can put in the chat the ones that are um, attending online if you're uh, fly fishing men or women. So be curious. Anyway, my name is Amy Reddy and I'm the chair of the Gallatin Valley Earth Day Committee. And I'm really looking forward to this talk um, from Lily about riparian areas. I don't know that much, and it's going to be fascinating. Um, but before we begin that, um, I just wanted to take a few moments to thank um, our sponsors. Our whole series of events are free for the most part because of the support from businesses and organizations and uh, nonprofits in our community. Come on here. Uh, I'd like to thank our fiscal sponsor, Greater Gallatin United Way, and our premier sponsors, the City of Bozeman, uh, Volkswagen of Bozeman, and Audi Bozeman, and our benefactor sponsors, Sacagawea Audubon Society, our local radio station, KGBM, Bozeman Greenville, and Montana Parents Magazine. And also our stewards, which include Happy Craft Pan, uh, Secretary of Ottoman Society, whoops, I already said that, I'm a little tired. Virtual Sea Area, Republic Services, CO, Bozeman Mountain Studio, and the Gallatin Wildlife Association. And of course, all of the community members who volunteer and help make this happen. And I'd like to give a special shout out to the underwriters of our event tonight. Um, which is Montana Angler and Fly Fishing and Trout, Mail from Gallatin Trout Unlimited. So uh, now, uh, before I introduce Lily, I just wanted to let you know that we will have a question and answer period um, when she gets done with the presentation. For those of you who are joining us online tonight, if you look at the bottom of your screen, it says q and A. If you just click on that q and A, it will pop up a window where you can type in your questions, and then our tech person, Joy or Mark here, will read your um, question to Lily so she can answer it. Uh, if you're in our live audience, just raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone over. That way, the people that are joining us online can hear your question. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Lily McLean from the Gallatin Watershed Council. Uh, Lily is the Restoration Director for the Gallatin Watershed Council, and she earned her master's degree in Bioresource Engineering from Montana State University. She believes that our efforts to protect natural resources in the Gallatin Valley are strongest together. So could you please join me in a round of applause to welcome Lily Lockdown? Oh, Can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for being here. Um, this is intimidating to me a little bit to be in front of people. I usually do this on Zoom. Uh, so it's great to see everybody's faces. Um, I'm going to try to ignore that we have maybe 50 people online. <laughs> but I'm going to pretend like I'm in the kitchen uh, with my husband. <laughs> uh, this is, I'm really passionate about trees. Uh, and that's because 
and work for the Del Marshall Council. And our mission is to guide collaborative stewardship of water in the Gallatin Valley for a healthy and productive landscape. And when I use that word collaborative, I don't mean that lightly. We work with many, many different organizations, many different demographics um, across interest groups. And what I love about my work is that we all have something in common with each other. And I work in that space, that common space. And I get to build connections between people because we all share a dependence on water. And we also all share a very limited supply of water. We all need that to be very clean. When we live in a watershed, we're forced to be part of the community. And that's why I love my work. And I'm in this community with you all. I'm in this community with the coyotes, with the fish, with the elk. And I work for them just as much as I work for you. And my obsession with trees all started because in my work, I listen to the community all the time. I'm like a professional listener. <laughs> And I listen to worries and I listen to hopes and dreams and wishes. And my job is to collect those and to problem solve and try to address, um, you know, find, find where we have commonality and try to build programs and grant fundraise and, and address um, those common issues. Um, and so a watershed council, that's what watershed groups do. We're a national model, we're nationally recognized. And that's what foundations and grants and agencies are looking to watershed councils to be that ear on the ground or right there with that pinch point. And so we're listening to our community, we're out talking to farmers and ranchers, we're out talking to the anglers, we're listening to the bikers, we're talking to scientists, and we're saying, okay, this is what we're hearing, and now I'm going to go talk to our state agencies, our federal agencies, and our foundations. We're going to try to bring that money and that capacity and help um, bring it to our community. And I am here today to recruit you in my collaborative effort so that you will join me and share in this passion for trees, because trees, I think, are the silver bullet. If there was ever a silver bullet, it's trees and it's our riparian areas, especially here in the Gallatin watershed. They solve everything. <laughs> you know, there's every person I talk to, to a T, cares about fish, they care about wildlife, they care about clean water, they care about risks due to flooding and erosion, and they care about drought. Riparian areas are a major, major tool in how we manage all of those. And so if there's anything that I'm gonna throw my weight behind to achieve my mission of collaborative stewardship of water, this is it. So I hope that by the end of today, you understand why, and then how, what you can do to participate and be part of the solution. Let's see, did I forget anything there? Okay, so we're going to start with trout. Uh, this is a fish I caught with my two brothers on um, the Galton River. Um, <laughs> took all three of us to, to land it. Um, best day of my life. Uh, he's still out there. So I want to set a scene. Um, I want you to imagine your favorite fishing hole. Uh, and I bet you it's under the roots of a willow. And I bet you those branches are reaching out over this dark pool. And that there's a haze of caddis flies and salmon flies and they're backlit by the sun. And there's warblers and maybe a ruby crown kinglet darting in and out. And you've got this perfect drift floating by. And you've got maybe you've got a goblin in on there, and you're hoping to coax a trout out from the depths of the pool. And you look up, and there's a um, a bald eagle, right? Catherine's bald eagle. Um, and you look up, and there's a bald eagle, and he's watching you, and he's 
judging you <laughs> and he's waiting for you to move on uh, so that he can have a little. And you take it, you know, you say, okay, I'm not successful, but you um you decide to head on down. Oop. We're getting feedback for the live on or the online live stream, so that's why I turned it down. Okay. So, okay. I'm gonna speak up a little bit. So so you move on, right? Your toes are cold in this cold, clear water, and you walk down the ripple over the cobbled stones, right? There, it's this clear bottom, cobbly stones. It's a little slippery. There's a little bit of algae there. And you head on down through the ripple to the next pool, and maybe there's a down log there, and it's sort of inky depths because it's lined with leaves, and those leaves are decomposing, and they're feeding this whole underground ecosystem. And that's what those nymphs are eating, right? So it's this whole system. And you say, you know, you're here you are, you're fishing here, and this is just the best day. Hey guys, I was hoping you weren't gonna come. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so then you decide because it's you know, it's time for a break, and you sit down on that um point bar and there's some sand and there's an old cottonwood log and you have a seat and you have a cigarette and you say i think this is paradise right the scene right here everything here is by design this is not an accident everything that you just experienced this paradise that you're experiencing is on purpose. Every single one of these things has a function. And so let's break that down and I'm gonna tie it back to trees. So fish, they need oxygen, they need food, they need shelter, and they need water, obviously. And we'll get to the water, we'll get back to that water piece because we're gonna talk about drought and, uh, and floods, but um, let's address each one of these separately. So first we're going to start with oxygen. Right there in the water, but still trout are highly dependent on, on oxygen. They've got um, you know, lots of blood vessels in their gills. It works just like our lungs. And trout are different than their friends the bass and walleye and perch. These guys need a ton of oxygen for their development, their metabolism. And so when they're swimming in the water, uh, it's just like us going for a run. And when there's not that much oxygen in the water, it's kind of like us going for a run with a straw. Or maybe we're coming from sea level and we're running uh, up at altitude. And so they're super dependent on that oxygen and that oxygen, in order to have oxygen in that water profile, we need super cold water because we get higher dissolved oxygen content in cold water. Um, <clears throat> we also need ripple pool sequences. So in order to have oxygen, we need some of that turbulence. So we need to be incorporating oxygen into the water profile. So that ripple pool sequence is not by accident. Uh, let's see, we also, um, when we have algae in our water, in our um, stream beds, that algae can suck oxygen out of the water column. So too much, some algae, okay, right? Feeding some of those nymphs, uh, sometimes the fish eat it but too much and we strip oxygen out of the water column. And so then they also need really deep shaded pools. So right, that structure of that stream is really important. So they have refuge in the summer where they're, they've got pockets of, uh, of cold water. And the other thing that influences how much oxygen in, is in the water column is sediment. So if you have too much sediment uh, in your water, it warms up. Right, so we need clear water for it to be cold. Otherwise we have this like thermal mass and that sun is hitting that sediment and it's warming everything up. So no, so no sediment, no algae, we need clean water, we need cold water uh, in order for there to be enough oxygen. Shelter. So since that water is so clear that those fish basically have a big target on their back. It's easy for that um, bald eagle, it's easy for that bald eagle to see down into that water column. And so 
they're just swimming around and they're like, oh God, oh God. But luckily we have a down log over here. Luckily we've got an overhanging bank. Luckily we've got these roots and these branches and these deep dark holes for them to hide in. So that's also by design. Because we have this clear water so that it's not nice and cold, it necessitates having these hiding places. Another part of shelter is that to spawn, for spawning, trout need um, that cobble bottom, right? That cobble bottom is by design because when they spawn, they make reds. So that female fish, she clears everything out. She moves all that sand and sediment out of the way. She clears all that algae out to lay her eggs and her eggs need a lot of oxygen. If she laid her eggs in sort of this mucky, muddy bottom, right? We can't have too much sediment because then those eggs wouldn't get that oxygen. And if there's too much sediment, she's going to work really hard to create that red. So that cobble bottom is not by accident. And so again, sediment is the enemy here. Um, and algae again, algae is another culprit here. Algae can can uh, clog that that uh, spawning habitat, and this is a double whammy because if we have too much algae and we have sediment, then we really clog. It's like accelerates that clogging, and we don't have spaces for uh, spaces for that spawning to happen. Food, food, rel uh, fish rely heavily on macroinvertebrates, and uh, especially a diet of uh, mayfly and caddis, uh, stonefly, and these particular types of um, macroinvertebrates are super, super sensitive to oxygen. They also, right, they have evolved alongside with their fish uh, who, who eat them, and they both depend on high levels of oxygen. And they also depend on that similar habitat structure where they're able to make their casings and latch on to stones, so they also rely on these clear cobble bottoms. And then fish, trout, uh, feed by sight. Catfish, they feed by smell. Fish by sight. And so when there's too much sediment in that water column, then they can't find their, their food. They've got to work too hard and we're impacting their, their metabolism and their growth and their development. So let's talk about how trees help. Oh. Here's, here we go. This is the slide. Water, oxygen, shelter, food. And so the way that trees help, here we've got a whole bunch of willows on the side. So first I'm going to start with, this is a, so channel structure. The reason why we have channels, the shape that they are with clear cobble bottoms and with deep pools and point bars and riffles are because trees and their roots, they stabilize the banks and they keep everything kind of tight in this meandering channel. And so right when we get a flood, and we'll talk more about this, this flood comes down and it erodes out. And you can see over here, we're eroding out up in the top um, part of the slide, comes and erodes out some of that cobble on the outside meander of the bend and it carries it downstream and it deposits it on these inside point bars and these riffles. And so what's, what's happening is we're carving it out, we're depositing it on the inside, we're carving it out, we're depositing on it on the inside bend. And that's sort of turning over the habitat, cleaning things out, brushing the sediment aside, and we're creating these overhanging banks, we're creating these point bars. And then when the flood settles, sediment falls out into that point bar and we get willow recruitment on the inside of these point bars. And when we get willow recruitment in there, it holds that point bar in place and keeps, pushes that flow out underneath this outside meander bend. And it maintains this tight channel where we can get this depth and these deep pools. And then it moves over that ripple sequence and it gets oxygenated. And then it goes down into a deep pool where it's got sort of that deeper habitat over the next ripple. And this is called dynamic equilibrium. And so our stream channels that are held in place by deep rooting native riparian vegetation are able to maintain and sustain 
this structure. And this is the, like the number one most critical thing for our fish habitat is maintaining dynamic equilibrium that is stable. And we'll come back to this when we talk about floods. But holding on, we live in a um, alluvial uh, fan. We've got this cobble bottom, or cobble alluvium, and then we've got this sediment, this silty sand. Stuart, help me. Less. Less. This is my soils professor. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't expect you to be here, and now I don't know anything about soils. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, alluvium. <laughs> so, but it's very dynamic, and so it adjusts to pressure pretty easily. So if you, this, these willows and dogwoods and um, alders, their roots are doing a lot of work. And when you remove those, the dynamic of this stream channel can change very drastically and the habitat can shift very drastically. And so without it, oh, here we go. Look here, we do our meander, our beautiful meander, where we're depositing these point bars We've got our willow and cottonwood recruitment coming out here, and we're making this beautiful meandering stream. Right here, so we've got these cottonwoods are really, really doing their work here. Beautiful photo by uh, Kestrel Ariel, so Chris Boyer. This is the East Skeleton River. This is why right here we've got our riparian zones forcing this channel shape and providing all that great length and that great habitat. And without it, this is what happens. We're doing a project out here. I'm really excited about this project. We did work on this project a little while ago. So this is the East Skeleton, this is Camp Creek. No riparian vegetation, everything changes. We're just dumping sediment into this system. Trout do not love this. They can't see their food. Their spine habitat is all choked out. We got a bunch of algae in this system. Ah, it's hot, right? No shade. And it's big solar collector. It's like a big solar panel. Same thing with this. No habitat complexity, just dumping sediment in. Uh, it's eroding very dynamically there. So the other thing that's not happening, let's see if I have this. Oh, oh yeah, here. So a couple other things that they're doing. So here we've got shade, we've got habitat complexity, all the dead bits of trees are super important because they're adding branches. That's habitat complexity. You know, once that it, it erodes, this bank erodes out, maybe this year that cottonwood falls in. An excellent habitat. And then, um, you know, those roots hanging over the leaves are adding to that, uh, to, the, to the food down, uh, down there for the, the nymphs and the, um, those caddis and salmon fly. And so all their dead bits are really important. And right, no dead bits here. There's no, no good habitat. We're not adding anything good here. <clears throat> and then the last thing that's happening here is that we have a whole bunch of non-point source pollution everywhere. So algae, right? Algae is not great and sediment's not great. And when we have this complexity all along our stream banks and we've got sediment coming in from our urban suburban systems or our agricultural fields or maybe our trails and our, our roads, it gets stopped in its tracks because of this riparian vegetation, thick, bushy stream sides trap all that sediment. Same thing when it floods, when the stream floods and it's carrying all that dirty water and it moves out onto its floodplain and it moves through this complex riparian vegetation, it drops its sediment. So it's tracking all that sediment and helping maintain that, that those cobble bottom uh, streams. And then nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. Nitrogen and phosphorus turn on algae. High temperature, nitrogen and phosphorus turn on algae. Right, that's choking our habitat, stripping oxygen from the water column. When we have high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus in our groundwater or our stormwater runoff, say from 
fertilizer or from septic drain fields or from, let's see, uh, dog waste, uh, manure, you know, any of that stuff that gets into the groundwater or is, you know, surface water flow, stormwater, and it moves through um, dense riparian vegetation and we've been cultivating these great soils, right? And so those nutrients get taken up by it from the shallow groundwater, right? We've got deep rooting woody plants and they're taking a soaking up a lot of the, those nutrients before they have a chance to get here. And they're taking it up and they're kind of holding it. It's like a big sink, a big nutrient sink. Um, and especially when we've got great soils because we're creating this like really dynamic ecosystem, those soils are full of really good microbes that are breaking down nitrogen, got lots of good absorption, absorption sites for phosphorus. And so this is your, your riparian buffer is removing all sorts of non-point source pollution and making sure that the, you know, the trout uh, have that oxygen and uh, places to spawn and their food have got plenty of places to, to live. So trees pretty much are the reason why this system looks the way it does and why that sort of idyllic trout stream that you have in your mind and you imagine, dream of this, and you say, you know, this is paradise. This is why people come here and pay lots of money to live here, to travel here, to, to vacation here. It's because of riparian vegetation. It's because of those willows, those dogwoods, those alder, um, and those cottonwoods, keeping everything in balance. Um, I don't know, should we take some questions before we move to floods? Maybe not. There's gonna be a lot of crossover. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna jump to, to remember everything I just said. <laughs> so there's a lot of crossover here. Um, so flooding, here's another photograph by Chris Boyer, Kestrel Aerial. This is the East Gallatin River in 2008. It's a 15 year flood. So when we say 15 year flood, that means about every 15 years, some, we should expect something of this size to come around. Um, kind of intense, but flooding is really important. It's part of this renewal. It's part of moving nutrients and carbon and sediment and all sorts of good stuff downstream to downstream aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. It's, Part of sort of turning things over, you know, it's like spring cleaning. We're sweeping out, you know, we're sweeping things out. We're saying, hey, I didn't like these clothes anyway. We're sending them to the thrift store. We're vacuuming, maybe a clean coat of paint. We're sprucing things up. We're turning things over. Um, and right, one man's trash is another man's treasure. So we're just moving things around. Um, and that's great. And it's really important that we do that. And that's part of this sort of dynamic equilibrium. But flooding can get really scary, right? So, okay, if we do some spring cleaning, but man, if we get a 20, 30, 40 year flood on a regular return interval, or maybe we have a system that isn't able to handle even smaller flood, that's kind of like taking all your furniture and throwing it out and brushing it every year, right? Fish can't handle that. That destroys, that shreds your, your aquatic ecosystem. They can handle it every now and then, a nice reset, a nice big flush. It's okay sometimes, but uh, all the time, man, that gets expensive. You know, you gotta go to Ikea and get new furniture. Um, and it's also really scary for, you know, property owners. Um, you know, these guys are pretty close, yikes. Uh, same thing, those guys are really close too. Um, and you know, this bank, they're, I bet they're losing a couple feet per year. Um, you know, that's scary. And we saw in the Yellowstone flood, I think that was a 500 year event. I don't know if it's a 500 100 year event anymore. Uh, might happen a little bit more often. With climate change, things are predicted to get worse. Um, with rain on snow events. And so flooding 
doesn't always stay in its floodplain, right? We think we're out of the floodplain. You know, I bet these guys look really closely at the floodplain map. And they had their house just outside the floodplain. You never doesn't care about your map floodplain. <laughs> your map floodplain is looking back in the past and looking at, you know, you're saying, where did it go last time? And, you know, where's our elevation today? Everything's changing out here. Everything's changing all the time. And so you better believe they're going to be in the floodplain. I bet they're in the floodplain now. Everything changes. And so there's sort of two things that we can do to mitigate uh, risks due to uh, flooding and erosion and maintain sort of at that stable, uh, healthy aquatic ecosystem. And that is slow the flow, stretch that hydrograph out, right? You guys are kayakers, you're watching for that peak. We want to stretch that out so that we're not slamming the system with all of our water supply all at once. The second thing that we can do is we can resist that force. Right, so if you think about a stream, say the the um, and it's lined with bedrock, that's a lot more resistant to something that is lined with your sort of cobbly alluvium, alluvial, alluvial, stuart. <laughs> um, so, how do trees help? First, it starts in our forests. When we have healthy forests, then we've got healthy understories. Uh, we hang on to our snow. That snow settles down in that forest. We've got this healthy um, soils and the snow percolates down and through our soils and this slows, everything slows down, moves down into our groundwater. And you can, and we also have, um, you know, this is really resistant to erosion right here because we've got a lot of great ground cover. And right, this is where our water starts. And you can imagine, right, if we had a mega fire rip through here, and we didn't have any of these trees providing shade for that snow, and that totally changes the what's on, you know, there's no duck, there's no logs, there's no nothing here anymore. It totally changes how water runs off the landscape. So healthy forest systems, um, you know, this is where things start. And so we want to avoid mega fires at all costs. Not at all costs, I don't know what that means, but uh, I'm sure there's a cost, but mega fires are really detrimental to, to watershed health. And then as we move down through that forested system, we've got lots of log jams, right? Here are trees here. And they're, you know, the water bumps into them, slows down, gets checked, um, gets trapped, creates these great wetland ecosystems, eco, ecosystems here. And that water is being held on that landscape, slow the flow. And then maybe we'll move a little bit further down in the uh, in the watershed and our beavers, the beaver dams. These things are huge. They store so much water. They throw, slow things down in a big way. You know, made possible by all of your trees here. Look at all this water that this, this thing is holding. That's huge for slowing down floodwaters. And then our floodplains, when water can, again, get hop its banks, and we want it to be able to hop its banks easily, right? It's not, if its banks are way up here and it can't access its floodplain, it's not spreading out and doing this. When it spreads out, it slows down. And it slows down a ton when it moves through this. You know, when it's moving through this, man, it's really getting the wind knocked out of its sails there. It's, dissipating those forces and it's slowing down and that water's moving down into the into the groundwater. I mean, into the soil profile. And, you know, if our system looks like this, none of that stuff is happening. You know, beaver's not gonna make a dam out of this. This isn't a log jam. <laughs> um, when the, you know, if this, when this system floods, there's nothing really to slow it down. This stuff is just pretty slippery. Um, so that's got, you know, we don't have any of our tools here to slow those floodwaters down when we don't have that riparian vegetation. <clears throat> and the same is true for drought. Right? So everything that I just said about flooding is also, you know, sort of the flip side of that coin is drought. So everything that we, all those tools that we have on that landscape from those log jams, those beaver dams, um, those flood intact floodplains, 
that's helping us with drought because that's holding that water on that landscape. Right, we got we got snow. Hey, it's starting it snowed today. Yay, very exciting. Um, but that's all we got. That's it for the whole year. This is all this, this is most of our water. Most of our water is snowpack driven. And when we ship, it's got to get us from from basically from March to March, all that snow. And it's got to, you know, grow wheat and barley and make our beer and we, so we can take our shower and we all got to use that. And we got to, it's got to get us a whole year around. And, you know, maybe we'll leave some for the fish. We're over allocated in our watershed. We're a closed basin. We're over allocated. What that means is that we have no more surface water rates left. We've given them all away and we've actually over allocated. So we've given away more water than we have annually from our surface water. And so we could theoretically dry up the Gallatin and the East Gallatin each year if everybody used all the water that they legally had a right to. We could. And the reason why we don't is for the most part because a bunch of irrigators get together and they say, all right, it's time to turn stuff off. We got to keep stuff in. Who's going to lose $1,000 today? Raise your hand. Right? It's the junior water rights holders who get shut off. And they do that uh, to keep water running in the stream, even though they have that legal right to that water. And so that's, that's it. That's all the water we have. And so when we slow it down, we get, otherwise we're shipping it out of town. We're like, you know, see ya, you know, it's a three fourths gone, you know. That's it. So if we can just oh, hang on to it, keep it in those beaver dams, push it out into those soils, that's super, super important. Um, and so when we don't, you know, it's this here's the other thing. So when we do that, when water moves down, uh is held on the landscape, it gets to get used, right? So our forest ecosystem, it's not gonna be a tinderbox come September because we're holding water. We were able to hold that water in that landscape. So those trees can keep drinking that water throughout the year. Our riparian ecosystem, we're holding that water and that water's, that groundwater table is elevated and that riparian ecosystem can survive throughout the year and provide its its services to stabilize the banks. And when we draw that water down, when we inside the stream, we draw down the water table and we're just siphoning the water out of the landscape and shipping it out of town. So every time we hold on, we push it back. We're hanging, we're elevating that groundwater table. We're sub irrigating our meadows, our pastures, our riparian areas, our forests. So, and when we do that, we can maintain healthy wildlife habitat throughout the year. And almost every single one of the species of wildlife that we have that are near and dear to our heart in the Gallatin Valley depend on riparian areas for at least part of their life cycle. So they represent, riparian areas represent about 5% of Montana's land cover, and they are the most important ecosystem for sustaining our wildlife. And so in order to do that, we need to maintain this high groundwater table, we need to slow the flow, we need to have uh, nice slow floods. Um, and then they're able to provide their ecosystem services to all of our uh, wildlife. Oh, we'll get there. So in order to maintain a healthy trout fishery, mitigate floods and drought, and maintain a thriving wildlife population, we need to slow the flow, stabilize stream channels, take up nutrients, prevent sediment, provide shade, provide beaver dams and log jams. Um, we need to filter sediment out of our floodwaters and stormwater, and we need a regular supply of leaf litter, detritus, and all sorts of dead bits of trees. So trees, every single one of those things is all brought to you, brought to you by our riparian areas. So this is what 
we can do about it. Uh, keep it wild and wishy out there. So here's the issue. All the red here represents where we have zero right grain vegetation. Zero, nilch, none. That's 40% of our stream miles. Yikes. Um, and then all this, uh, let's see, yellow represents with another 10%. So we've got 40% of our stream miles are missing any right grain vegetation, then another 10% has got less than optimal. Uh, we've got a problem. And what we first and foremost need to do is give stream space to regrow native right crane vegetation. And at a minimum, small streams need 100 feet on either side. Medium streams need 150 feet on either side. And large streams need 300 feet on either side. And this is based on uh, a whole bunch of literature um, out of uh, a lot of really great work out of Montana Department of Environmental Quality and Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Um, and then taking a look at uh, our channel migration zones and our uh, you know, patterns of flooding. And if we want to, our stream systems, right? It all works together as a system. It's not, when you think of a river, it, don't think of it just as its channel. That's just one piece of the river. The river is its channel, its floodplain, and its riparian area. Because that water is moving either very, very close to the surface, sort of at the surface, very close to the surface, or sometimes it's just moving right on through. The whole thing is conveying water and it's super essential. It's all working together to provide these ecosystem services, maintaining a healthy trout fishery, mitigating flout, flout, drought and flood. <laughs> flout. <laughs> yes. Um, and then it's also working to treat um, treat any non-point source pollution, right? It's and when we're treating that pollution, it's all about residence time. The longer, the bigger that buffer, the longer that water has time to be in contact with those soils and have those plants take up those nutrients. And so the bigger the better, but we absolutely need at a minimum for our small streams, 100 feet, medium, 150, large streams, 300. And within that buffer, let's practice best management practices. Recreate with care. Search and destroy noxious weeds. Those guys will uh, talk to Stuart about that afterwards. He's like, some help with that. Um, and those guys, uh, noxious weeds will really kick over and make it challenging for a native community to establish. Um, don't know, unless it's part of your weed management regime. Do not apply fertilizer and non herbicide pesticides. Manage grazing. Not all grazing is bad. Some grazing is actually these riparian systems really evolved right alongside with a lot of disturbance. Right, they're browsing from elk and from deer and from beaver, and that kind of like turns them on, you know. And when that willow gets chomped on, it's like tomorrow he's shot up a whole bunch of extra branches. Um, so not all grazing is bad; it can actually really help be part of the restoration story. Leave the leaves. My dad. I hope I wonder if he's listening. <laughs> <laughs> We pick up sticks. All we love picking up sticks. Leave them. Um, cultivate crops outside the buffer and build outside the buffer. So right, this is we can all do this together. This is going to take a group effort. When we look at this, this is take. This is going to take a group effort. I need everybody with me. I don't care what your job is. Are you a planner? Are you a teacher? Are you um, a consultant? Uh, maybe you have a lot of money or you a uh, foundation. Um, doesn't matter who this, there's 50,000 parcels in the Gallatin County. We, and we all need to be part of this solution, part of this story. And so whatever we can do to implement these best management practices in our lives, whether it's just going for a run or whether it's because we own a large section of the Gallatin, whatever, we do what we can. Plant trees, or plant a tree, plant 100, 
And you can do that with us, or maybe again, you're a landowner and we have a guide. So replanting your stream sides, we've got a guide for you. It's just a, it's got a draft. We've got a new version, really beautiful version coming out soon, but we've got a few copies in the back. Uh, you can do it. A lot of these streams, they don't need bulldozers. They don't need a whole bunch of crazy stuff. You know, those huge eroding banks I showed you, those kind of need a heavier hand. But most of our streams just need us to back off and plant some trees. And those trees, they don't even have to be like $150 trees. They can be teeny little um, saplings and seedlings, I mean, and then they can be cuttings. A lot of these trees, so willows, for example, you just chop off their arm and plant it in the soil and it grows a new willow. You know, you can do this. I, mean, I want to empower you to do this. If you don't have a bunch of land by the stream, which I don't, um, come volunteer with us. We've got all sorts of volunteer events. We've got a great program called Branch Out Bozeman, and that's all about um, growing our urban tree canopy because when we have canopy over our city streets, that stormwater is cool, right? Instead of hitting hot asphalt, that stormwater is much cooler. And then also we've got a lot of stream corridors in our city. We want to replant all of them. We want to take those back. We want to reimagine them and have them be beautiful sanctuaries of cottonwoods and aspens. And right now in our more um, underserved communities is where we have some pretty mangy looking forgotten streams. And there's fish in there. That's really important trout habitat actually, these spring creeks. Let's plant the hit heck out of them. So come volunteer with us in the city of Bozeman. We're also doing projects across the watershed and we wanna build a tree fund. We need trees. We wanna have a robust volunteer program. We do, we wanna grow it. Hey, how about 500 trees a year? And we want to do that with community volunteers. We wanna build that program, grow that program. So you can volunteer with us, um, plant your own tree or contribute to the, the tree fund. This is huge. Envision Gallatin future land use map. How many in here knew that this is happening? This is massive. The county is doing a massive land use planning exercise right now, and they're on a very fast track. And we've got some really awesome people working at the county as staff, and we've got some really great commissioners, and I think that they're listening, and I think that we have a chance here. And so when we're talking about what we want those buffers to be and everything here, why they're important, let them know, participate, join us. We're gonna be participating in this process. Uh, where's Catherine, our water policy manager? Um, and if you sign up on our newsletter, you know we're keeping track of this and we're participating in this, but we need to be a squeaky wheel for water and wildlife. Um, and I think we've got folks that are really interested in being part of the solution. And I think that when we are bringing, giving water a seat at the table, that's how we have a chance to impact things. It's not because people don't want to have wildlife habitat and want, everybody wants clean water. It's about the knowledge gap. So it's showing up and being a squeaky wheel and saying, you know, housing right now, they are a very squeaky wheel. We need to be that squeaky too. So sign up for our newsletter, stay tuned for opportunities to volunteer uh, for restoration opportunities and grant opportunities. Um, you know, we're always managing a bunch of different restoration projects out um, across the watershed, both in the city and, and out in the county. We'd love to go for a walk with you. And even if it's not, we're not the right group to be working with, we're this hub and we are talking to it. everybody else. Every week I talk to everybody, I promise you. And we can hook you up with the right person. And then of course, donate. We can't do this without funding. And we've got an amazing staff and they're incredibly dedicated. And water in the Gallatin watershed requires dedication. And this is a 
This is not a, a moonlighting job. This takes a lot of effort and it's deserving of a, of a lot of effort. Um, and I'm really proud of our, our staff. And um, yeah, maybe Holly, you can raise your hand, our executive director. Yeah. And I think we do a, some really great work. So yeah, thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, thank, thank you so much. That was really interesting and very educational. And so we have, we have to get out of here before the library closes today, but we have about 12 minutes for uh, questions. So I know that we already have a few questions coming in online, but is there anyone in the audience here? If you just raise your hand, I'll bring that microphone over to you and then we'll switch over to an online question. Thanks, Lily. That was great. Um, I have a question about this green corridors. And your one of your last slides where you had the hundred feet, hundred fifty feet, three hundred. And so I don't know where Bridge Creek falls into that. Maybe a medium stream. Um, but currently, we do see in the city of Roseman is seventy-five feet. For the setback, and in some places, that's not done. And so I was just wondering what your efforts might be with the city on the UGC update. Yeah. Yeah, so the, um, that process has been stalled a little bit, and it's been a little bit um, interesting because they've been doing the U main UDC update, but then they've also been doing um, a wetland uh, code update. And Article 6 is where we have all the natural resources stuff from our wetlands for our water courses. And that Article 6 is that natural resources, and it's um, that's where we have those setbacks. And so um, Commissioner Cunningham, Mayor Cunningham now, um, was a big proponent of, of wetlands and trying to figure out how do we mitigate those wetlands more locally. And then we had sort of this whole big UDC effort not quite sure if the rest of Article 6 is going to be addressed or not. So the water course setbacks, we're not sure. It's kind of like, uh, it might be something that's slipping through the cracks. In this sort of reconsolidation and trying to like figure out for the city, trying to figure out how to restart that public engagement in the UDC, maybe we will see those water course setbacks um, sort of emerge as part of a bigger package. And that's what we would like to see. And I think that's something that we can be asking for saying, hey, don't forget, it's not just about wetlands. It's also about these water course setbacks. And I think there's a couple of different things that we can do there um, is I think we've got a lot of clarifying to do in that section. We've got actually pretty good, besides the setbacks being smaller than I'd like them to be, um, we actually have some pretty good protective language and I think it just gets kind of lost. So that section just needs some cleaning up and some clarifying. Um, but then I think we're just coming out with this guidance document that we're calling the Water Course Commons Initiative. And that's where um, we're recommending these and those are, um, that's in a draft form right now. And uh, we're really excited to have these numbers um, be we're having everything be peer reviewed by our different um, partners and having this gives us that sort of scientific justification so we can start that conversation to say hey i know we're said there's 75 right now but actually we want we want 100 and maybe and i have to look at the list we have a list of that those large medium and it's actually medium and ecologically significant because right? some of those spring creeks are really small but they're very ecologically significant. They need that extra. And then all the rest is the small. So got to go back and look at that list and say, hey, we did our homework. Can you please? Yeah. And I think we'd love your help in that. So. Hey, um, okay, now, uh, Jory, uh, we have a question online. Uh, yes, we have an online question. How do irrigation ditches fit into this model? Yeah, so when we say a water course, we mean a stream and we mean a stream ditch. We do not mean a ditch. And so we rely on the Gallatin Conservation District to provide us with that just that uh, definition. 
And so the Gallatin Conservation District applies, or uh, they're the administrators of the 310 law, and they regulate the stream bed and bank. Uh, really interesting local government process, the Gallatin Conservation District, um, anyway. But they take jurisdiction over streams and stream ditches. And so a stream ditch is a stream that conveys um, irrigation water and then gets pulled out later. So it looks a lot like a stream. Um, if you turn the head gate off, it would still run with water is pretty much what that means. And so, but for a agricultural water user facility is a ditch. And that, if you turn the head gate off, it runs dry. Yep. So they also need protection. Those irrigation ditches also need protection. That irrigation network is a major tool on our landscape to recharge our aquifer and to keep our open spaces open, essentially, because that's how farmers operate. But when we, can, we can't go there yet, that's a totally different set of factors um, and players that go into sort of establishing protection of those, um, that ditch network, that irrigation network. It's deserving of it, of it, but this effort is not uh, encompassing of that. Great, thank you. Do okay, we have another question from our audience here? Oh, okay. Hold on. Can we hold the microphone? You can hold it close to your mouth, please. You mentioned recharging aquifers, the groundwater. I mean, there's so many wells. I mean, North of Dublin, we live 200, 300, 400 feet wells. Uh, how do you know what's going on with that? How can you tell? I mean, it, when your well runs dry, I guess that's not a good sign. But how do, how do we know what's, I mean, uh, can we just end sort of just put wells and wells and wells and wells? No, we can't. This is getting a little bit outside of my comfort zone, so I'm going to answer it a little bit. We have a relatively simple aquifer, it's an unconfined aquifer. And so our aquifer, our underground ecosystem is very connected to our surface water. So we're pretty sure when you poke a hole in the aquifer, that that's every drop you pull out of the aquifer is a drop that's not seen by the trout later. There's a couple different things happening um, with some lawsuits and at the state level with the NRC that is trying to address that challenge better because right, you can poke holes in as um, exempt wells in some cases, but it's pretty connected. Yeah. And so I think it was interesting that um, if a farmer say convert, converts to center pivot and maybe they're no longer flood irrigated, we don't believe that, say it's this farmer in this house, this house is going to be building a new well soon. Yeah, so it's very connected. And I'm going to stop there. It's, that's very, that's a very complicated question. Thank you. Um, Jory, are there any more online questions? No? Okay. Then, uh, Last call for any uh, more questions here. If not, then uh, great. I, um, I'm just going to wrap up. How about one more uh, round of applause? Uh, I just wanted to thank you all for coming. And uh, can you take your slides? Thank you. Um, okay, great. I just wanted to um, thank you for coming. And uh, um, I wanted to let you know if you wanted to get notices about our upcoming events, there's a, a sheet over on that table where you can uh, sign up and, and get our newsletter. Or if you're visiting online, you can go to gallonvalleyusa.org and, and sign up for a newsletter there. Um, I wanted to tell you about some exciting upcoming events, actually. You can really like trees. There's a really fun workshop that we're holding here um, on April 12th and 14th. Uh, you can sign up to learn about riparian forests <laughs> with Ashley Martin. Uh, there's a limit of 12 people, and it costs $30 per person. 
and she's really great. It's a really fun time, the workshop, and you can just go to gallatinvalleygroupday.org to register for that workshop. If you'd like to come to our next talk, uh, we have another tree talk, a uh, great one, Old Grove Forest of Montana. Where are they? Why are they important? And what can you do to save them? And we're bringing Joan Balloon in. Um, she is an author, she's written a number of books on Old Grove Forest, and she's the founder of the Old Grove Forest Network. And uh, it'll be at the Museum of the Rockies on April 11th. And come for our 6 p.m. reception. We have a lot of good food and drinks. And there'll be uh, exhibits about trees. And there are also, Joan will be there to, you can purchase and then have her sign her latest book on Old Grove Forest. So that should be a really fun evening. And uh, then, of course, please join us for our uh, annual Gatlin Valley Birthday Festival. There's something for everyone there. We have music, live music. We have great food from Orchard Spoon. Kinds of great kids' activities. There's a magic monster show that's very popular, face painting. Uh, there's a uh, chance for kids to do educational programs and win prizes. Every kid was surprised. <laughs> so it's very fun. For the adults, there's also talks every hour. Uh, a lot of really interesting talks you can find out about on our website. And also, we have um, a live rapture presentation um, at 1 30 and 2 30. Also there, and there, there are lots of uh, lots and lots of exhibits, including electric cars and composting, everything you can think of that um, is involved with Earth Day. So it's a lot of fun, and uh, please join us. So I wanted to thank Lily one more time and thank you all for coming. And I hope to see you at our next event. Thank you. Well, we have some really interesting um, information that our people back here want to to the and talk about the